you all again here thank you very much for coming and I hope you enjoyed uh, my Canadian souvenir the snow so inshallah that's that's my gift to you from Canada so uh, inshallah you like it Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim walhamdulillah rabbil alameen bari al-khala'iq ajma'in ba'ath al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen thumma salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا يا ابن رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة رزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتكم وشفاعتكم في الدنيا والآخرة أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما بلغ معه السعي قال يا بني إني أرى في المنام أني أذبحك فانظر ماذا ترى قال يا أبت افعل ما تؤمر ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين فلما أسلم وتله للجبين وناديناه أي يا إبراهيم قد صدقت الرؤيا إنا كذلك نجزي المحسنين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Continuing with our discussion from last night where we began about the concept of giving where we said that in this world sometimes we're so busy accumulating things that sometimes we forget about the basics and one of the basics is to give and we mentioned that it's important when we give we give with pleasure we give not expecting anything in return and we also said that giving is not only limited to giving financial help to others but rather sometimes we can give time can give some kind words there are a whole bunch of things to be given and we to the best of our ability let's try to give whatever talent God Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with let's share it with the community and the world now one important aspect about giving 
in order to stimulate people internally to give is an important concept which is the concept of content content being pleased with what we have that's something important we live in a world today where we are bombarded by advertisements and marketing everywhere you go just now if you walk on the street you see a billboard for example you turn on the internet you'll see some advertisement throwing at you you listen to the radio an advertisement and of course you find companies invest literally millions of dollars in marketing in marketing why because it works it works what one of the aims and objectives of this marketing is to turn your wants into needs that's one one objective of it you've got a gadget you know many of us have these gadgets in our hands in our pockets everywhere we go we have them and they work just fine it's wonderful great now a new gadget comes into the market and they tell you oh that one the camera has so many megapixels much better resolution it's much faster speed it's better whole bunch of bells and whistles and you think oh i need to get that one no really do you need to yes i need to because that's all aimed at gearing you to think that you need it it's in fact and it works really i mean the advertisement it's such a great advertisement that it tunes you think you think that i need it but really do you really need it do you need to invest the next you know two or three hundred dollars or pounds or whatever it is to acquire this gadget when your gadget it does the job for you and it works just as fine now what happens is no 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 I need it you know do you remember those good old TVs you know those box ones you know that like you find them in the museum these days you know you go how many homes do you go to these days and you find one of those you know, rarely like I mean I was surprised the other day to walk into a house in the in England and I think only in England you find these things in people's homes you know to find one of those boxes you know and I was like oh cool actually some house has one of these still left over man you know, this is cool because Literally, I, I was in, in Melbourne, in, in um, Australia, in Melbourne. There's a city called Melbourne in Australia. It's the second largest city in Australia. You go there, and I went to the Science Museum there. They have a Science Museum? They had one of those TVs in the Science Museum. And you think, my God, man, this is like my era, you know? <laughs> it makes you feel old. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, you go into people's home. When these things came out, these flat screens, it came out as if you need this and the advertisement is all geared towards that that you need this it's not a want it's a need so what ends up happening is a person says okay no no I need this okay we need we need to get this okay well I don't have the money for it oh no problem what do the company say you do finance it credit interest free for one year or two years Do you guys have this this kind of advertisements here no problem. Buy it. No interest. Zero. For one year. You've got a whole year to pay it off. Okay. Oh, great. Wonderful. So I go buy it. And of course, I buy this gadget and that gadget and that gadget. And all of a sudden, I've got, you know, 5,000 pounds worth of debt. All interest-free. All good for the first year. Comes the second year. <laughs> and that's where you say, Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi rajiun. <laughs> Now, what drives all this? Now, but you see what happens is now a person has accumulated a debt of, let's say, two or three thousand pounds. Now, I don't know about you here in the UK, but in Canada, in Canada, the average loan, individual, personal loan, besides a mortgage, that does not include the mortgage, the average is $16,000. And this is now, like, you know, this just before I came, a statistic came out, a study came out. They said that the average personal loan in Canada is $16,000 and does not include your mortgage. This is not the mortgage. Okay. So imagine $16,000 in debt. 
Now, what do you have to do? What does a person will have to do? Go. Now I have to work my second shift because now all of a sudden you can't. A person will be forced to go and work the second shift or the wife would say, you know what? I will need to go and work as well, for example. So now you have two, the, the husband and the wife in a household going to work. <coughs> and then what ends up happening in Canada, actually they motivate, they encourage people to do this. So now the wife would say, well, but we have children. What do we do with the children? What do we do? Daycare. Do you call it daycare here? Uh, nursery, nursery, sorry, you know, Canadians, you know. So, nursery, daycare. Okay. Now, interestingly, I, I met, a, I had a, one of my professors when I was doing a PhD. He said, I asked him, you know, we're just having conversations. I said, so does your wife work as well? He said, she used to, but she, she stopped. And I said, why? He said, because whatever money she used to make, we used to spend it on the nursery, on the daycare. Yeah. So I told her, what's the point? You stay at home, whatever salary I make is enough. At least the children will stay with you. But you see the cycle, they encourage you to put your children in the nursery. <coughs> Why? Because from business perspective, it's great as a business model. Now you're working, so you're paying taxes, great. Your children are in the nursery, so the person who's running the nursery is paying taxes. Everything is going well now from a financial point of view. Okay. But now when you put your children in these nurseries, do they teach them akhlaq? Do they teach them ethics, attitude? I mean, think about it. We're not saying that the nursery is bad. Please don't take me wrong here. I'm not saying that at all. Nor am I saying don't put your children in nurseries. Please don't put words in my mouth. Okay, although I just said it. But <laughs> what I'm saying is when you have a person who's the nursery take, you know, caregiver, you know, the, the daycare caregiver, She's got, she's by herself. Now, I don't know about your laws here, but there in, in Canada, for example, you're allowed nine children per one person. So she's got nine children and she's by herself. Now, imagine, I don't know about you guys who have two or three kids in your house. You know, they probably drive you insane. That's only, and they're, they're your own children, two or three kids. They probably drive you insane. Imagine having nine, not two or three. Okay, so having nine children. Now, She's a human being after all. She cannot look after each and every one of them. <coughs> exactly, you know, take, telling them, behave well, your attitude, your ethics, your akhlaq, your words, your language. It's impossible. Nine kids. So sometimes the best thing to do is turn on the television for them. Turn on the television and let them just watch television the whole day. Now, television. Well, you guys see what's offered on television these days. If you haven't, please do sometimes. Even the cartoons these days. The language they use in the cartoons, the attitude they use in the cartoons towards their friends, towards their, you know, parents. For example, in some cartoons, the pranks, oh, it's funny, a prank, but you're hurting others. That's why I say sometimes, in a subtle way, cartoons are responsible for bullying. That's my, that's my personal opinion. I haven't done any research into this matter. But sometimes, some of the things that they do in cartoons, they make it funny to make fun of others. It's a joke. But it's not really a joke. You're hurting others. Nonetheless, but you see how the society now is disintegrating. But what was one of the causes is that because we did not, were not happy, were not content with what we had. I cannot afford this. So you know what? It's okay. Alhamdulillah, I have that big giant box. No problem. It does the job. My gadget, it does the job. I don't really need that. Yes, I want it, but I don't need it. So realizing what we need and differentiating it from what we want is an important factor in having a content and happy life, being happy with what we have. That's why Imam Ali, alayhi salam, said... who's the Prophet's cousin and his son-in-law, and he's his successor as well, and the father of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. He has a beautiful saying. He says, extravagance, israf, is when you wear what you don't own, and you live in what you don't own, and you eat what you don't own, what's not yours. 
It sounds like the credit system, doesn't it? These days, we buy our clothes on credit. We don't have the money for it. Okay? Although we own it, but it's not really ours per se, because you're paying for the credit company. Our food is on credit. Our life is on credit. Our entire existence is on credit these days. And we saw what happened in 2008 because of the credit. In one month in the United States alone, one month, I still remember this, I was listening to the radio in 2008 or 2009, I can't remember now, in February, I still remember this vividly. Either 2008 or 2009 in February, they said in this month, 2000, you know, this, this month alone, one million homes were foreclosed in the United States. One million, imagine one million. That's one million people having to go live in the tents or in the street. One million homes foreclosed. That whole system, Imam Ali says that's extravagance. You gotta budget things. You gotta look after things. Don't just accumulate, accumulate. And that's what this whole society does. This whole society, like I said, the advertisement, the marketing. And by society, I don't mean this society like here in the UK. In fact, the whole world is behaving like this these days. All over the world. You do, go take a vacation. You're working too hard. Don't have money for a vacation? No problem. You can take a vacation and pay for it like next year. Don't you see these offers? Well, now here, let me take a vacation then. I'll pay for it next year. And I can afford it. I'll pay for it next year. Yeah, well, really. You also could afford this next year and the gadget next year. And all of a sudden, next year, you have 10,000 pounds in debts or $16,000 in debts. And can you afford? No, you can't. So budgeting, looking after things, being content with what we have is extremely important as a community, as a society, as a family, as an individual. One aspect that can help us with this is to realize that whatever we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm happy with whatever I have. Now I understand sometimes there is social pressure, social pressure that plays a role. A person says, you know what? That big box of mine is okay, no problem. A person comes to visit you in the house. Oh, you still have one of those? You haven't bought one of these screens yet? And you'll hear people saying this sometimes. Now, what does that make you feel? Oh, oh okay, well, maybe I need to get one of those. So there's social pressure sometimes, that's understandable. And it's hard to resist social pressure. And you might be able to convince yourself, but now when you've got external factors, that, that's a bit more difficult. Okay. And that's why, brothers and sisters, make sure you never make fun of anyone for whatever they have. Never. You find a person drives, for example, an old car. Oh, you still have one of those cars? Mr. Bean's car. <laughs> Remember that car? You, you drive one of those. Well, so what? It does the job. Because that could hurt the individual. Like, okay, well, every time I go to the mosque, they make fun of me, Mr. Bean's car. You know. So now I need to buy a new car. Well, that's a big investment. Okay. People come to my house. Oh, you still have that big box TV? Well, okay, now I guess I need to buy one of those because every time a person comes, he makes fun of this. You see how it's, how it's working? So sometimes we really have to be careful. We might be thinking it's a joke, but it's not really a joke. Okay. Whatever people have, we don't mention it. We mind our own business. Mind our own business. And then who cares? The nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not about driving a good car, living in the best house, having the best flat screen TV. It's not that. You may find a person who drives Mr. Bean's car, who lives in a humble house, has got one of those big TVs, yet he is closer to Allah than you and I. He is wali of awliya Allah al-salihin.
a man says, I was in Samarra, in Samarra, the city of Samarra, northern Iraq, where Imam al-Askar and Hadi are buried. He says, we were praying. A person comes and sits next to me in the Salat. Now, we were in the first row. Because he says, you know, usually the ulama, the sheikhs, the sayyids, you know, the ones with turbans, they would stand in the first row. The dignitaries would stand in the first row. This person, apparently his clothes suggest that he's a humble, modest man, you know. He came and stood in the first row. He prayed. We prayed all. You know, this person says, I felt some arrogance at the beginning. You know, after we finish the salat, you know how you shake people's hands after the prayers. He says, I don't know, should I shake his hands or not? You know, first of all, he shouldn't be sitting here. You know, because this is the first row. Okay, first class. So, second, you know, he doesn't, I don't know. But he said, then I thought to myself, A'udhu Billah, Mishra you know, what am I talking about? You know, here I am I just praying in the masjid, and this is what I'm thinking about. You know? So I turned to him and I shook his hands. When I shook his hand, he had such a beautiful fragrance coming out of him. Very nice smell. I told him, what smell is this? He says, what smell? I don't have any perfume on. He said, you're joking. He said, I made sure, no, the smell is coming from this guy. It's coming, a beautiful fragrance is coming from him. Are you sure? He said, I don't have any fragrance on. I can't even afford a fragrance. I don't have anything on. He said, that's when I turned to Allah and I said, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayhi. Oh Allah, forgive me. If this man who does not have any fragrance smells so nice. Subhanallah. Maybe he's a mu'min, he's a muttaqi, he's one of those believers. Whom Allah blessed him with such a beautiful fragrance, even though he's not wearing anything <laughs> as a fragrance. So sometimes we can't judge people, you know, as they say, don't judge a book by its cover. Okay. Those people. So we really need to look after what we say, how we interact, how we behave. Very important lessons we learn. And Imam al Hussein salam on the day of Ashura taught us such lessons. You know, John, John, who was an, a black slave. Of course, he was freed many years ago, but he stayed with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. And he was an old man, by the way. He was not young because John was a slave of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, Allah ta'ala alayhi. Abu Dhar freed him, but he stayed with Abu Dhar. He didn't want to leave Abu Dhar. Then when Abu Dhar died, he went to Imam Ali alayhi salam and said, can I serve you? Imam Ali alayhi salam told him, you're a free man. Why do you want to serve me? He said, I want to serve you. I don't want to leave you. He said, Ahlan wa sahlan, come. So he stayed in the house of Imam Ali. Then Imam al Hassan. Then Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam. So he was not really a young man. John. On the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, told him, John, why don't you leave me? You know, you stayed with us to learn from us, to benefit from us. Now we're getting killed. So I give you permission, leave me. Imam al John said, No, Ya ibn Rasulullah, son of the Prophet, please, please give me the honor of being with you. I want to die with you. So Imam al Hussein salam said, Sure, John. If that's the case, Ahlan wa sahlan. And he got killed in the battle. And again, it is said there was beautiful fragrance coming from his body. Anyone who walked by him. There was another young man, or not that young. He was a Turkish slave, Ghulamun Turki. Turkey. Turkish, not from Turkey, the one we know of today. Okay, because back then it was not Turkey in those days. That way, those days was the Byzantium Empire. Okay, so it was not that Turkey. When we say Turkish, it's coming from a little bit further than Iran, that region there. That's where the Turkish people were at the time. And then if you read about history, due to wars and things like that, that's how they managed to get to present-day Turkey. And Turkey was established. But back in those days when we say Turkish, it was not from Turkey, Turkey, you know, present-day Turkey. Nonetheless, this man was a Turkish slave, but he was freed. Again, he was freed. He was a free man. He was a free man. On the day of Ashura, again, he asked Imam al Hussein to stay with him, and he got killed in the battle moments before he dies, moments. Imam al Hussein used to walk to his companions. He, he would walk to the companions just before they leave dunya. You know, as they're dying on the plains of Karbala, he would walk. 
he walks to this man and he puts his cheek on the cheek of this dying Turkish man. He opens his eyes, smiles, He said, who is like me? And the cheek of the Prophet's grandson is touching my cheek. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam does the same thing to his son Ali al-Akbar. Same. You see the respect, the akhlaq, the manners. These are not just stories we hear about and we cry over. These are lessons that we need to implement in our lives. That this is how we deal with people. Whether he is Ali al-Akbar, who is from Bani Hashim, Imam Hussein's son, or whether he's Ghulam in Turkey, or a black man, John, there's no difference. This is what Ahlul Bayt taught us. We respect all humanity, irrespective of where they come from. In fact, there was a Christian man on the Battle of Karbala by the name of Wahab, Wahab al Nasrani. Wahab. And he who had just been married two weeks ago, he had a two weeks old bride. Or, a, you know, been a, not two weeks old bride, but the marriage was only two weeks old. And he joins Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura from the akhlaq he sees from Imam al Hussein, the character, such a great character, quality. His mother tells him, this man, when she looks at Imam al Hussein, a man who is like Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, in his virtue, in his ethics. He tells her he is the son of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And from that virtue, from the akhlaq, from the character of Imam Hussein, on the day of Ashura, he becomes a Muslim. On the day of Ashura, and minutes later, he gets martyred. And yet Imam al Hussein accepted him, respected him. This is what we learn. Okay. That this is how we should treat each other and to not apply pressure to people, not make fun of anyone. <sighs> Believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, realizing that He is our ultimate giver, can help us be content with what we have. The story or the verses I recited at the beginning of the lecture today from Surah al safat talk about the story of Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhi salam. The story is mentioned in the Bible, but it's about Isaac, not Ismail. Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Abraham, sees in the dream that he is to kill his son Ismail. He sees the dream repeatedly. That's why he comes to his son. قَالَ يَا إِنِّي أَرَى أَرَى means I see. Not إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ I saw. I see. And the reason he says I see, it means I'm seeing repeatedly. Not just once. He saw the dream once, twice, three times repeatedly. That's why he uses a present tense verb. I see, I am seeing. Inni ara. This is when Ismail became a young man. First of all, Ibrahim did not have any children until he was about 90 years old. He had no children. So when he was blessed with his son Ismail from Hajar or Hagar, Allah ordered him, now I want you to take him to Mecca in the middle of nowhere, in a desert. Leave him in the valley. So he did. He took his wife, Hagar, and Ismail, put him in the middle of nowhere, in the desert. And he himself says, Oh Allah, I'm leaving my progeny here in a valley that has no vegetation. Desert. At your sacred mosque. Sacred house. Baytika al muharram so, he leaves him. Then, after 18 years, he's given permission to go back and see him. He comes back. He sees him. 
Now Allah tells him, go kill him. Go kill him. So, he says to his son, but look at the beautiful interaction here between the father and the son. He brings his son. He doesn't tell his son, come here, come here boy. You know, I'm told to go kill you, so go get ready, I'm going to get kill, kill you right now. This is not the way we talk. He takes his advice, son, I am seeing in the dream that I'm killing you. What do you think? What do you suggest? Advising. You know, the hadith says, a child is a king for seven years, then a servant for seven, and an advisor for seven. King for seven years does not mean that he does whatever he wants. Because some people interpret it this way, a king. No, you got to educate him, you got to teach him. A king does not mean he does whatever. You know, you find people, young children, roaming around, doing whatever they want, and tell the parents, you know, educate him. He's a king. I know he's a king. Doesn't mean he does whatever he wants. A king means simply that sometimes you make a plan. And how many times has it happened? You decide to come to the mosque, for example. You make everything, get everything ready. All of a sudden, you come to the child, he's got fever. For example, high fever. Uh oh, we got to take him to the hospital. So now all your plans have changed. Right? Or the child has just gone to sleep. If we wake him up, he'll be very, you know, stressed and will cause us a lot of stress at the mosque. So one of the parents decides, okay, I'll stay with him. You can go. So the plans change. And that's what the king does. You know, king basically changes your plan to suit himself. It does not mean even kings have advisors, have ministers who advise them, try to educate them. So it, just because he's a king, it doesn't mean we leave him. We educate him, teach him what's right and what's wrong. Seven years, we start educating them about Salat, Siyam, Halal, Haram. Of course, you educate them from before, but by seven, they have to implement. We have to implement. I tell people, don't wait until your son is 15 years old and then come and teach him now, let's pray. He's a teenager. It's too late then. He'll tell you, oh, ma'asalama, forget it. I've got my Xbox to play with. When he's seven, start teaching him how to pray. Yes, maybe a day on, day off, it's okay. But by age eight, nine, he's mastered it already. He does it every day. Same thing with fasting. Try to train him and the child. Same thing with the girl. Well, the girl is at the age of nine. So we've got to train them since they're young. By the age of 14, we take them as advisors, helpers. What do you think? Like Ibrahim is doing to his son, Ismail. Son, what do you think? And how polite is the son when he responds to his father? قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ Oh father, do as you are commanded. And look how polite he is. Ibrahim said, I see in my dream. He did not say, do at whatever your dream is done saying to you. No, he's trying to confirm or make it easy for the father. That, oh father, whatever you're seeing in the dream is a command from Allah. Therefore, do as Allah is commanding you to do. And you will find me, inshallah, to be patient. You'll find me patient. And that's another important thing. Look at how respectful Ismail is to his father, Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Whereas, unfortunately, you see some of the youth these days and the children these days, the way they talk to their parents. Complete disrespect. And again, some of it comes from the cartoons they're watching. Go back to the point I made. We really have to look after what they're doing. It's really easy to turn on the television for the children and let them watch. It's very easy. It's much more difficult to sit down and teach them and educate them. Requires more work. Cartoon is not going to teach them how to read the Quran. Cartoon is not going to teach them how to pray. How to talk to your parents. In fact, have you seen how some, some characters in the cartoon speak to their parents? How they behave, if you've seen. So it's really important. But look at how respectful this child is. 
we invest time on our children, they will invest time on us. It is said that Prophet Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, one day he was passing by a cemetery. This hadith is narrated by Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Imam al-Baqir in the book of Amali by Sheikh al-Saduq, he says, Isa alayhi salam was passing by a cemetery. He turned to Allah and he said, My Lord, allow me to listen what's going on in the cemetery. What's happening in the graves? So Allah gives him permission. He hears. One thing catches his attention. A person who is in severe punishment and is crying from the pain of the punishment. He goes. A year later, he comes back by the same cemetery. Again, he asks Allah, make me listen. So Allah allows him to listen. Something catches his attention. He turns to Allah and says, Ya Allah, the voice I heard last year that was in severe pain, it was really shouting. It was kind of unique out of the rest. I don't hear it anymore. What happened to that person? He said, this man who you're talking about, he has a son who's a pious son. Waladun Salih, a good son. This son of his, at night, he prays to me. And he raises his hand and he says, Rabbi wali wali وَرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا O oh my Lord, forgive my parents. Forgive my parents. And he would pray to me, and he would cry, Ya Allah, forgive my father. Until, Allah is telling Isa salam, until I was embarrassed of not accepting his dua. So I accepted his dua and I forgave his father. Now it's important that we raise our children to remember us so that they also raise their hand and say, Rabbi wali wali And they wouldn't be, God forbid, in other places that they shouldn't be attending to. That requires time. Here, Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail give such an example. Then, Ibrahim submits and Ismail submits. Falamma aslama. 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 What does aslama mean? It doesn't mean they became Muslims. No, they're already Muslim. Ibrahim, Khalilullah, Ismail, the Bihullah, prophets of Allah. It doesn't mean that they became Muslims. They said the Shahad. Obviously not. Aslama means they submitted to the command of Allah. Aslama. Allah wants me to kill you, I'll kill you. That's it. He picks up the knife, sharpens it, and he puts it onto the neck of Ismail alayhi salam. And he tries to slaughter. Now say this is the sharp end of the knife. He puts it on, the knife turns this way. A second time, a third time, and then Ibrahim would say, knife, slaughter. And the knife responds, Al-Khalil Ya'amuruni Wal-Jalil Yanhani. The Khalil, Khalilullah Ibrahim is ordering me and the mighty one, Al-Jalil Allah is forbidding me. Aslama. He submitted. وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ We called him, O oh Ibrahim, قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا You fulfilled the dream. You did what you were asked to do. And then Allah says, إِنَّا كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ This is how we reward the virtuous ones, the good doers. Muhsin, Muhsinin. This was not easy. The thing about Ibrahim, he did it with content. 
He did it. It was not an easy test. Imagine you kill your own son. Good Lord. I mean, those of you who have a son or a daughter, if one day your son or daughter be has high fever, never mind getting killed, has high fever, you would find that you will not sleep the night. You will take him in the middle of the night and go to the hospital. And you'll try to talk to the doctor, please help him, you know, and, and you'll, you'll be in distress the whole day because he's got fever. Now imagine, God forbid, you have to kill him. That's, not, that's why Allah says this was a major test. It's a major test for Ibrahim. He did it, however, with content, with pleasure, with happiness. Ibrahim, he was happy. Why? Because he knows, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. To God we belong and to him we shall return. Imam Ali al-Nahj al-Balagh alayhi salam says, inna lillah iqrarun bil mulk wa inna ilayhi raji'oon iqrarun bil hulk. Inna lillah, you are confessing that you belong to Allah. You don't belong to yourself. To Allah we belong, which means whatever He tells me to do, I what? I do it. Allah tells me, my sister, put on your hijab. I put on the hijab because that's what Allah wants me to do. I don't say, no, this environment is difficult. The society is difficult. My job, my school. Yes, ya Allah. I'll put it on. Allah tells me, my dear brother, don't wear these tight clothings that sometimes has become a fashion among these youths. I'll say, yes, ya Allah. I will do it. Allah says, do not listen to this haram music. And there's been a lot of questions you can hear from last night. Yes, ya Allah. I will do it. Allah says, be kind to others. Don't backbite, don't slander, don't insult someone. Yes, Ya Allah, I will do it. Inna lillah, because we belong to him. Wa inna ilayhi raji'oon is a confession that you are not going to last in dunya. You're going to go back to Allah. Nobody's going to live here forever. Nobody. Allah says to the Holy Prophet in the Quran, if you're dying, if you're going to die, they think they will last forever? If the Prophet ﷺ, Habibullah died, you think you and I will last in dunya? That's why the Imam ﷺ says, if this world was eternal, then the Prophets would be the most worthy ones to live in it for eternity. If the prophets are dying, what about us? When we have such a mentality that, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, inna lillah wa inna, then why should I not be happy about everything Allah gives me or takes away from me? Because anything that Allah gives me is a gift. Is a gift. In fact, anything He gives me is a loan. A loan. Think of it as a loan. You go sometimes to different city, you rent a car, a rental. Beautiful car, very nice. At the end of the day, is it yours? No, it's not. So when you give it back, do you feel bad? No, because, because you know this is a loan, not yours. Think of everything you have in dunya as a loan. Everything. Your health is a loan. Your wealth is a loan. Your children are alone. Everything is alone. And your life is also alone. One day it's also going to be taken away from you. You have to give it back. Whether you like it or you don't. This way, when we think like this, then, خلاص. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi I lose my job. Well, ilahi lakal hamd. My job was alone. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un. It doesn't mean that I sit back and just khalas say inna lillah. Of course not. I have to go and look. Work hard. But I wouldn't be so depressed. Oh my goodness, what? How could I lose this job? Ya Allah, why did you do this to me? Well, billah. You hear people saying this sometimes? 
Why did you do this to me? It's alone. I lose, God forbid, a person loses his son. God forbid. It's very difficult. It's a loan from Allah. And Allah has taken back the loan. I lose my health. I lose my loved ones. And so on. You live in this life this way, you'll be content, happy. And Imam Ali says, Anyone who has content will never be in poverty and never be in need. And in another hadith, anyone who lives with content will always live in happiness. And stress free. You won't be stressed. Of course, there are stressful things that will happen to your life. This is part of life. Things will happen. But it's all alone because I'm happy, content. Here is Ibrahim alayhi salam submitting to Allah with content, happiness. We need to be like this, brothers and sisters. We need to always submit with happiness. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah saved his son and sent him a ram, a sheep, a ram, that was slaughtered in exchange for Ismail alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, however, he gave his sons two of them. But there was no ram to save them. And he also gave them in content. His baby, six months old, baby, was shot with an arrow right on his arms. It really put pain in his heart. It was not an easy moment. After all, he's a father. But he turns to Allah and says, Allahumma ridhan bi qadaik. In kana hadha yurdhik, fakhudh hatta tarwa. Oh Allah, I am content with what you decree. If this pleases you, then take from me until you are fully pleased. But it really put a pain in his heart. Ahlul Bayt were in pain. Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam, as I mentioned last night, 30 years would cry. A man one day came to him and said, Yabna Rasulillah, why do you cry so much? He told him, Ya'qub, the Prophet Jacob, alayhi salam, lost his son Yusuf, <coughs> lost him. And he knew he was alive. He cried so much that he went blind. And I saw with my own eyes 18 moons, as he described, moons, akmar, of my family members, 18 of them, get slaughtered right in the front of my eyes. And you don't want me to cry? It's not easy. The journey from Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa to Sham, was not an easy journey. What they experienced was not an easy experience. Yet you'd still find Zainab alayhi salam. Despite all this, she goes to enter before Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad in Kufa. And he tells her, how did you find what Allah has done to you and to your family members? She said, from Allah, I have not seen anything but beautiful things. مَا رَأَيْتُ إِلَّا جَمِيلًا But it is you, Ibn Ziyad, who killed my brother and my family members. You brought me as a prisoner. Despite all this, Imam al-Sajjad says, I saw my aunt Zainab praying Salatul Layl throughout the journey. Salatul Layl. <coughs> These days, brothers and sisters, these days, Salat al-Fajr is at about 6.15 approximately, approximately. How many of us pray Salat al-Layl these days? These days. 
I don't think anyone has an excuse not to pray Salatul Layl these days. Most of us get up for work anyways at about 6 o'clock, or some people do. Get up 15 minutes earlier at 6 o'clock, get up 15 minutes before Salat al-Fajr. Pray at least the last three raka'at of Salat al-Layl, at least. And then pray Salat al-Fajr. Why wouldn't we do that? What excuse do we have? And if you can't, or you don't know how to pray it, it's available online. Just Google Salatul Layl. Salatul Layl. You see the methodology. The last three raka'at, it will not take you more than 10 minutes. 10 minutes. At least the last three. Zainab, alayha salam, she was a prisoner. In her journey, Imam al-Sajjad, I would, say, I would see her praying every night Salatul Layl. The only difference is prior to Karbala, she used to pray standing. After Karbala, she would pray sitting. And I would ask her, why my aunt? She says, my nephew, I've lost my strength. Not easy, what we had to go through. They were content. But there were some difficult moments in Sham, in the middle of the night, one night, a little girl of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam wakes up. A girl about three years old. Some say her name was Sukaina, others say her name was Ruqayya. Either way, Ruqayya or Sukaina. Ruqayya. Ruqayya wakes up in the middle of the night. She turns to her aunt Zainab. She says, My aunt Zainab, I just saw my father. In my dream I miss him where is he Zainab alayhi salam started crying she said my little girl your father is in a long journey she says but I just saw him I want him and she starts crying and the whole family starts crying the news reaches the palace of Yazid ibn Muawiyah he says what is the matter they said one of the daughters of Hussein has just woken up and she wants her father. He said to them, then take the head of her father to her. They put the head on a plate. They cover the plate. And they take it to this little girl. Sayyid ibn Tawu says, When the girl first saw the plate covered, she thought there was food in the plate. She turned towards her aunt Zainab salam and said, عم زينب لقد عزفت نفسي عن الطعام. My aunt Zainab, I don't want food. I want my father Abi Abdullah Al Hussein. Zainab عليه السلام said, My little girl, remove the cover. She said, The minute she removed the cover, she saw the head of her father, Abi Abdullah Al Hussein, covered in blood. She threw herself on the head of Imam Al Hussein and cried, Abataya, Man al Ladi Hazawamid, Aba Man al Ladi Khandaba Shaybatak, Aba Man Lin Nisa'i Wal Aitami Badak. Oh, Father Abba Abdullah, why is your beard covered in blood? Oh, Father who beheaded you. Oh, Father who will take care of me after you. She started crying. The woman started crying. And all of a sudden, this little girl went into a deep silence. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam turned to his aunt Zainab and said, My Amma, Amma Zainab, remove her from the head of my father for now. She has joined my father, Abi Abdullah Al Hussein. Ammar Fa'ina Falakad Fa'arakat Al Hayat. Zainab alayhi salam came to her. She picked up the girl. She turned her over. She saw the girl is lifeless. She turned to the head of Al Imam Al Hussein and said, Akhi Hussein, Unzur Ilayna. Oh, Brother Hussein, look at your sister Zainab and what I have to experience in this journey. Then when the caravan went back to Karbala, it is said Zainab alayhi salam 
came to the grave of Imam Al Hussein. Uh, she cried there and she said, Oh, Abu Abdullah, I have to make an apology. Why are you apologizing, Ya Zainab? You told me to take care of the women and the children after you, and I did so. However, your beloved Ruqay was buried in Shaya. Ah, ah,